Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings listeners and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we are based here in the UK, all times are in GMT. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 17th to the 23rd of March. I'm Features Editor Ezzy Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Katrin Rayner. Hello, Katrin. Hi, Ezzy. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm excited to see what we've got coming up in this week's Night Sky. Okay, well, it's another big week. You know, we had the total lunar eclipse last week, and this week we have two biggies on the 23rd. We have the ring plane crossing of Saturn, And also Venus is at inferior solar conjunction. And it's also officially the start of spring and galaxy season begins. The unofficial galaxy season, I should uh, mention here is my unofficial naming. I know some astronomers like lament the advancing as we move into spring and summer because the nights get shorter. However, it should also mean that it's getting warmer, which I, for one, will appreciate. (laughs) I know. And I'm going to start with the spring equinox. So I hope this will warm you up a little bit, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Ezzy. So yay, it's officially the start of spring on the 20th of March at 9.01 a.m. It is the vernal or spring equinox. So falling between the summer and winter solstices are the spring and autumn equinoxes. And the word equinox is Latin and translates as equal night. So the equinoxes occur when the Earth's axis points neither towards or away from the sun, And it's a point in time when the sun crosses the celestial equator, either northwards or southwards, depending on the the time of year. And yeah, on on the equinoxes, the sun is above the horizon for the same amount of time as it is below, hence the name equinox. Mm -hmm. So on the 20th, we will have roughly 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. The sun will rise on the 20th at 6.14 a.m. and set at 6.20 8 p.m. and those in the southern hemisphere will be marking the start of autumn and they can have it we've had enough now haven't we (laughs) we're looking forward to the spring and summer so yeah something to look forward to on the 20th moonwise on the 17th of march the moon will be at aphelion so it's furthest point in its orbit from the sun and it's also going to be at apogee when it is at its furthest point from the earth as well So the moon will be waning. It's going to be a waning gibbous and 89% lit, rising at 22.18 p.m. And on the 20th of March, for those listeners in the Southern Hemisphere, they will enjoy a lunar occultation of Antares. So the moon and Antares, the heart of the Scorpion, the brightest star in Scorpio, will both be 11 degrees above the southern horizon in the early hours. Sometimes we do find with the media, they hear that one of these things is happening, like an occultation is happening and they pick up on it and they don't always understand that it can't be seen everywhere. So it will only be visible from the Southern Hemisphere. But for those of you lucky enough to be down there, I I hope it looks good for you. In the Northern Hemisphere, Antares and the Moon are going to be very close together. So Yeah, just because you don't see the moment the star disappears behind the Moon. You'll see them getting closer to each other and then further apart on the other side. So you'll st- you can still see the two together. Yeah, and they're pretty much like right opposite each other, aren't they? Mm-hmm. There. So yeah, it'll be a lovely sight to see. And on the twenty second of March, the moon is at last quarter and will be fifty three percent lit, rising in the early morning just before three a.m. and setting after nine a.m. Solar system wise, we'll start with Neptune. You know, we can't see it at the moment, but on the 19th, the ice planet will be at solar conjunction, meaning that it is extremely close to the sun. But over the next few months, as Neptune moves away from the sun, it will become visible again in the pre-dawn sky. And on the 23rd, this is it, Azzy. You know, it's a very exciting event that we won't be seeing. I know. It keeps happening. <laughs> it does. I know. It's just it's so annoying, isn't it? I just feel like we're always, always missing out, but it's not. No one's going to see it, are they? No. Because obviously it's it's where the planet is. So yeah, so the Earth is crossing the ring plane of Saturn today. And over previous months, astronomers and people with telescopes and you know anyone viewing Saturn have been watching Saturn's ring slowly disappearing. 
And as we've mentioned, Saturn is too close to the sun at the moment for us to see this event. So yeah, it's a real shame because it's not like it happens every year. <laughs> it does strike me as sort of strangely ironic that the day that Saturn's rings temporarily disappear, we won't be able to see because it'll have <laughs> temporarily disappeared behind the sun. It's yeah. just something a bit poetic about that to me. It's doing a disappearing act, isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, these ring plane crossings happen every 13 to 15 years. So it's not like we can see this again in 2027 or something. But in simple terms, you know, when we view Saturn from Earth during a ring plane crossing, it does look like the rings have disappeared because we are looking at the planet edge on. And this is because just like Earth, Saturn's axis is tilted. And in Saturn's case, it is tilted at 26.7 degrees relative to its orbit around the sun. And this is, of course, why we can see those lovely rings. And just for comparison, Earth isn't far off. We tilt at an angle of 23.5 degrees. And, you know, Saturn completes its orbit every 29.4 years or so around the sun. And because of its tilt, it's experiencing solstices and even seasons just like we do. And in between its summer and winter, the angle of its tilt becomes less. And from Earth, we see the planet side on during its equinoxes. So at these 13 to 15 year intervals, the rings are edge on to the sun rather than tilted. And that's why it looks like the rings have disappeared. So I guess that means that Saturn and Earth are both having their equinoxes at about the same time. Oh, uh, yes, of course. Which yeah. is completely by chance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's also very cool, isn't it? Mm. But yeah, it's a shame, you know, as we say, because when these ring plane crossings happen, there's some really great opportunities to view Saturn's moons and moons have been discovered mm. during these crossings because, in effect, the rings, you know, well, they're very, very bright, aren't they? Yeah. And when they're at this angle, when we're looking at them from this angle, we can see things that may have not noticed them before because because of how bright the rings are. It is one of the annoying parts of astronomy is that you are rather at the whims of the universe. So you kind of have to just go with what they want you to see at that particular time. And sometimes sometimes they are very obliging and they give you spectacular sights and sometimes they're very annoying and hide what you want to see at the time you want to see it. Yes, we'll just roll with the punches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I did actually write an article about this, the ring plane crossing for the March issue of the Sky at Night, which is out now if, if you'd like to read more about that. And it was a really interesting article to read around the subject. Mm -hmm. On the 23rd, we also have Venus in the limelight. So it's at inferior solar conjunction today, meaning that Venus will be passing very close to the sun as its orbit carries it between the Earth and the sun. It's also going to be at its closest point to Earth. It's appearing extremely large, but also exceptionally thin. So it's a very, very thin crescent. And after this point, so after today, Venus will make a return to the early morning skies as the morning star. You know, as I'm sure you've gathered, due to how close it is to the sun, a bit like Saturn, we won't be able to see Venus at this time. Well, there is a caveat. <laughs> Unless you are very experienced at locating and capturing Venus. So there is a really great section in this month's Sky Guide Challenge in the Sky Night magazine. But, you know, like we have spoken about in the past for Mercury, don't attempt to look for Venus at this time because it is so so close to the sun if you're inexperienced yeah. just don't bother wait for the photographs it is possible to do it safely to see the two together if you don't know what you're doing do not risk it it's not worth it there will be other chances to do something like this in the future so maybe just wait until you've gotten a bit more experienced and you understand what you're doing a bit more and you can be really really sure that you're not going to accidentally capture any of the sun in your optics as you're looking for venus because we, we really, really don't want you to hurt your eyesight. Yeah, and you know, I've seen photographs, obviously, when I was researching this, and it's just the tiniest, tiniest slither. So it's going to be so hard to see, you know, unless, mm -hmm. unless you do know what you're looking for. But I, for one, won't be attempting it. Yeah. No. <laughs> it will roll around again in a, another couple of months' time, so it'll be another opportunity if you want to, like, bone up on all of these various different techniques. But, you know, yeah, just, just make sure that you know what you're doing. Yeah. And so all week then, you know, as I've said, Neptune and Saturn, they're not visible. Mars remains in Gemini all week. It's pretty much visible all night long. And by the end of the week sets about quarter past four in the morning. Uranus still hanging around, can be located below the Pleiades and 
by the end of the week sets before midnight at 11.24 p.m. Jupiter in Taurus, still prominent in the night sky, but obviously it's setting earlier, so by the end of the week it will be setting at 1.10 a.m. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, galaxy season. For those people who love a deep sky object, you know, this is a really exciting time for them, and maybe for people who are just hearing the term might think, oh, well, the nights are getting lighter, so why is now a great time to be looking for galaxies? So I think it's purely just down to how many galaxies are well positioned yeah. at this time of year because Earth's orientation relative to our galaxy allows a clearer view of distant galaxies and, and free from the interference of the Milky Way's dense star field. So The Milky Way, which is us looking through the plane of our galaxy, has a lot of very, very beautiful things in it to see, lots of various different nebulas and stars and all kinds of weird and wonderful things in our own galaxy. Unfortunately, it also means that there's a lot of stars and dust and other gubbins blocking your view further out into the universe. Mm. Yeah, and, and observers can spot some of the most prominent galaxies in the sky. So you've got the Whirlpool Galaxy M51, the Sombrero Galaxy M104, and and the grand expanse of the Andromeda Galaxy M31. And I think one of the most popular, perhaps, group of galaxies to look out for is the Leo Triplet. Mm. So these are all spiral galaxies in the constellation of Leo. And in a really dark sky spot, you can view these galaxies with a pair of binoculars or small telescopes. So, yeah, it's a great time to get out and, and try and spot some of these galaxies so yeah and like I said it doesn't matter if you've got binoculars or a telescope as long as you're somewhere dark enough especially if you want to try viewing with the binoculars then there's plenty to see and in a preview of the April issue of Sky and Night magazine we actually have a feature on the realm of galaxies coming up which is in Virgo and there you're looking at what's called the Virgo supercluster. So it's this massive cluster with a whole bunch of galaxies all in the same area of sky. And we have given you the highlights of some of the, the biggest and the best to go and see in that particular area of sky. So now is a great time to go out and see galaxies. And hopefully if you manage to get out there and see any or capture photos of any, because they're always great photography targets as well. Bit of a tricky one. Sometimes you have to get quite a lot of light to be able to, to image these things. But you've seen some absolutely fantastic results. And if you do take any particularly good photos, as always, we love to see them. We print the best ones in the magazine. Send them in to us at contactus at skyatnightmagazine.com. I've put a link in the show notes below. There always is telling you where to go to submit all of those great photos. And hopefully we'll see some of those coming in in the next couple of months. But thank you for taking us through all of that, Katrin. Lots of wonderful things to see, as always. And if you want to keep up to date with even more stargazing highlights, please subscribe to the podcast and we'll be back next week with even more stargazing tips. But to summarise this week again, we start at the 17th of March when the moon is at Aphelion and at Apogee. On the 19th, Neptune is at solar conjunction. It's not visible at the moment, but it will soon become visible in the pre-dawn sky. On the 20th, it is the spring or vernal equinox. Autumn and Antares are close together in the early morning sky and those in the southern hemisphere will enjoy an occultation of Antares as well. On the 22nd, the moon will be at last quarter. On the 23rd, it is the ring plane crossing of Saturn. Unfortunately, it's not going to be visible from anywhere in the world due to Saturn's proximity to the sun. Also on that day, Venus is going to be at inferior solar conjunction, but do be careful if you're trying to see that one because it is very close to the sun. Now that spring is underway, galaxy season has started, meaning that there are going to be lots of galaxies which will be well positioned in the night sky to be able to see. That's all from us for this week. We'll be back next week with Mary McIntyre. From all of us here at Star Diary, goodbye. 
If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered, with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. 